Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if you could perhaps take your seats, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, as we might kick the night off. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Hugh McKenzie. I'm a councillor at the City of Launceston and also the chair of the Heritage Advisory Committee at the City of Launceston. Uh, so it gives me great pleasure to be here tonight. And uh, I used this word this afternoon when we were talking about the Ariana Titmus. Uh, medals and, and her recognition. Wow, it's great to see so many people here tonight. It's really fantastic. This is something, a slightly new initiative for, for, for Launceston uh, Council to sort of put together and collaborate with other parties to, to, to put it together. But I certainly need to a big shout out to Fiona and Jaime from the Council and other officers in the Council for pulling this all together tonight. The name of tonight is Places of Launceston, which is learning from the past and looking to the future is the sort of catchphrase to go with that, and I'll go into that a little bit more shortly. But I thought I'd just kick off firstly by acknowledging the Tasmanian Aboriginal people as the traditional owners and custodians on the land on which we're meeting today. I'd also like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and acknowledge any Aboriginal people who are here with us this evening. I'd also like to acknowledge some distinguished guests, uh, Honourable Rosemary Armitage, MLC, uh, Councillors Alan Harris, uh, Councillor Walker, uh, Tim Walker, Councillor Andrew Dawkins, and Councillor Krista Priest, our newly minted councillor, so welcome, Krista. Um, and uh, also members of the Heritage Advisory Committee from the City of Launceston, which I won't name because I've seen some of you and I haven't seen all of you, so I won't go through and say that, but thank you very much for your continued support uh, in the things that we do at Council. Um, tonight we're going to have some interesting things. We're going to try and do things uh, a little bit by Zoom because COVID has interrupted the uh, speaker program that we had and we were hoping to have Professor Rob Adams from the City of Melbourne here with us in person tonight but because of COVID that's not been possible. Uh, and as I was saying to a gentleman at the back of the room, everything I've been to lately that's had a Zoom <laughs> come in from out of state hasn't worked particularly well, but fingers crossed tonight that will that will happen as, as, as expected. Uh, and we've got another great array of speakers to come and speak to us because tonight is about conversations, but I'll talk about that a little bit um, sooner. The first thing I really want to talk about this year, um, as I say, we're launching the first uh, for the first time a series of events which focus on the importance of our unique built environment and the value it provides to the city now and into the future. The Places of Launceston series includes a revamped Heritage Awards program, including our Heritage Snap Photography Award for students, uh, Open House Lonnie, uh, presented by the Australian Institute of Architects, and conversations with experts which embrace the value of our city's architecture, public spaces and landscapes to our economy, society, environment and culture. The Launceston Heritage Awards are an initiative of the City of Launceston Heritage Advisory Committee aimed at celebrating projects that make improvements to the heritage places whilst maintaining their heritage values of otherwise or, or otherwise and otherwise provoke the city's valued cultural heritage. Since 2014, the awards have incorporated a photographic competition for school-aged children, uh, students I should use that word, uh, aimed at inspiring our young people to take an interest in and get involved with our built heritage. Uh, due to the ongoing popularity of the photog photographic competition uh, for students, this year we're encouraging the photographic entries from people of all ages um, by broadening the promotion category to become an inclusive highlighting heritage award, which means people of other than students can actually enter. This year we're also including a new award for unbuilt design proposals uh, for adaptive reuse of heritage sites developed by UTAS School of Architecture and Design Students, uh, Reimagining Heritage, uh, which will be organised separately within that school, so looking forward to seeing that. Entries for all the other categories are open today, so the Built Heritage Awards and Highlighting Heritage entries close on the 15th of September, and entries of, for Heritage Snap will close on the 22nd of September. For more details on that, I think there were some brochures as you walked in, so take one of those on the way out if that interests you to be involved, or you can go to our website at Council, which is www.launceston.tas.gov.au slash heritage. 
Um, so I encourage all of you to participate in that. It's been great fun for me. I've been involved in the Heritage Advisory Committee for four or five years now and it's been terrific and you probably saw as we were uh, uh, having drinks and nibbles before some uh, outcomes of some of the photos uh, from the Heritage Snap uh, of past years. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to invite Jennifer Nichols, uh, who's the Australian Institute of Architects Executive Director uh, here in Tasmania, an international chapter, and she is she's joining us from Hobart to talk to us about Open House Program. Thank you very much. Thank you all. It's so lovely to be here, and what a beautiful city you have. Open House um, Launceston is a local event um, that we're running that is based on the global program that was first held in London in 1992. It was started by a woman called, named Victoria Thornton and it now runs o across the world in over 30 cities. It's a bit of a global phenomenon. It gives visitors the chance to see how others live, work and play. Look up, look inside, look behind the scenes have a sticky beak and see their own city from a different angle. It's a program that welcomes locals and visitors alike. We are delighted this year to be in Launceston to deliver this program. We have held the program here two other years. So we had a break um, last year because of COVID, um, but we're back this year for our third year and we're delighted to be able to share the um, buildings of Launceston with the public. We're very grateful, firstly, to our partners, the City of Launceston, the Tasmanian Government, Access Solutions, Fatago, Austral Bricks, Lysart and Houses Magazine. But Open House is a sum of so many more parts than that. It's a program that absolutely cannot be delivered without many. This is a program that this year will open probably over 30 um, places and buildings, and it takes a great number of building owners, custodians, volunteers, institute, um, family and community and staff to run this event. And we're very grateful to you all. I'm delighted to announce that this year the program will include a number of buildings um, and, and places that people will explore. These will include the ABC um, offices here in Launceston, the Taswater pump station, the basement at QV Mag, where they will run um, a beautiful natural sciences tour of their archive. We have small houses in the program, um, the Tasmanian House. We have Stony Rise Vineyard, Supreme Court, and a number of walking tours. Um, historic walking tours of about half a dozen historical church churches, which will involve an organist going around the city with the um, tour, led by Ian Borsma. Um, and Hans Meyer, the organist, will play at each of these locations. We will have a tour, a discovery tour of the Cataract Gorge, um, led by a local Indigenous um, person, Geoffrey McLean. And we're delighted to have all of these places in the program. Um, the program, just for everyone's information, the website will launch this evening at about 6 p.m. So that might be now. Um, and from tomorrow at 12 p.m., you'll be able to book your experiences. So we'd really encourage you all to get on to to the www.openhousehobart.org website, having had a really good opportunity to peruse the um, buildings that are in that and book your experiences. Um, Open House, as I mentioned, is a sum of so many parts, but at the core of it, it is a program that is about social equity. The equity of this program is that it allows everyone in to this experience for free. So people can see the workings of our city, they can experience and behold uh, the wonders that architecture can bring to our human experience. And I look forward to seeing you all at the program. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you, Jennifer. Wow, that sounds exciting as well. Uh, just ver the veritable stike, uh, steak knives add, really, and there's still more. Um, so this is fantastic. So tonight's event is the first of the conversations conceived uh, to further dialogue on the value of the city's built environment uh, and will be the launch of our inaugural Places of Launceston event series, something we hope to extend into the future. 
With the theme of learning from the past and looking to the future, we will commence the conversation with presentations by professionals in urban design and built heritage, and we've got a couple of fantastic uh, speakers to listen to. And that'll be followed up by a panel discussion, including local designers and change makers. It will also serve as the official opening of the entries for this year's Heritage Awards and the Heritage Snap and the launch of Open House Launceston. So now we're going to be tested with the whole concept. That's fantastic. Uh, getting the thumbs up in the back of the room uh, for our first presenter who will be joining us uh, by screen tonight. So I'd just like to introduce Professor Rob Adams AM, um, uh, who is at the City of Melbourne. So since joining the City of Melbourne in 1985, uh, Rob Adams led the rejuvenation of Central Melbourne. He received the Prime Minister's Environmentalist of the Year in 2008, the Order of Australia in 2007, and the Australian Institute of Architects National President's Award in 2018. And his city design team have received over 150 international, state and local awards. Since November 2020, he has fulfilled, he has fulfilled an advisor and mentoring role to the city architect, while also setting his own, up setting up his own practice, Adams Urban. Tonight, Rob will be sharing his experiences in shaping the city of Melbourne over the last 35 years, and I'm sure there will be some useful advice that we can apply here in Launceston. So, I look forward to listening to Rob, and I'm going to clap my hands, and hopefully, he's going to appear on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done. Well, welcome, Rob. Um, I'll hand over to you to further present and, and introduce what you're going to speak to us about. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. And uh, I only wish I was sitting there with you. Um, all the best laid plans, but there you go. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, all right. That's, a, that's the most nerve wracking part over for me. Um, I'd like to just start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the uh, Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung uh, people's land. Um, and uh, also acknowledge uh, that you meeting on the Stony Creek Nations plans land and just pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. I'm gonna start in a strange place. This is actually in Zimbabwe and uh, that's where I was born and that's where I spent half of my life. And uh, I'm showing you this slide because I, when I look back on a career that has now been 50 years uh, as a, a qualified architect and urban designer, I realized that most of what I've done with that career is adaptation. And what is fascinating me is the way that cities do adapt. And one of the first exercises I had way back as a young architect was uh, I was lecturing at the uh, University of Zimbabwe where I had set up an urban design course, but I was also looking a lot at squatter settlements. And um, the things that usually bug squatter settlements are the things that they're on marginal land and they can't get services. In. This slide you're looking at is a place called Chiramba Hoyo, um, which unfortunately no longer exists. And what happened here is they'd laid the land out for an established housing settlement. So you can see a pattern there of streets, open spaces, and these things here were public toilets. And they were about to start building the houses when the land was squatted on. And what followed for me was an absolutely fascinating uh, experience where people adapted their environment. They had recognized the land parcels, but they started to work with their environment and adapt it. So they built some early um, houses and then they started to build more substantial houses around those. And eventually they moved the old house out through the front door and you know, created their first dwelling. They were doing this at a cost much less than government could do it at. So government would cost in the region of $5,000 a dwelling. This house, the white one cost $176 uh, for the dwelling. So there were reclaimed materials, there were sun-dried bricks, it was a whole process that was set up. The woman started um, a lending society so they could pool their money and, and improve it. And there were material stores and there was, um, you know, workshops. You can see an open air welder here. And there were schools, uh, you know, out in the open. So the resilience of these people in, in developing the environment was something that I find quite fascinating. Another project that I, I did was to convert tobacco barns and grading sheds into a primary school. 
And this was uh, shortly after independence and it was, um, you know, there was a need for schools. Um, the independent government put every child into school and it was one of the programs that was highly successful. And this was taking an old building and reusing it. And when I look back at my career, I realized that, um, for instance, I've lived in 14 houses uh, and I've adapted most of them, but I've, I've never built a new house. And the process I've been through in Melbourne is very much one of adaptation. And the name I've given it is urban choreography. Uh, and the reason I've given it that rather than urban design is there are so many players in the city and there's so much that you are required to do that it is more akin to urban choreography than it is uh, to urban design. So I'm gonna take you through a bit of what that's all about tonight. Um, and hopefully uh, there's some uh, you know, value in that for you. Um, Melbourne was uh, a city that was very urbane. It, it had fantastic streets, but in the 1980s it was languishing. Um, and some of the new developments that are coming in the top left-hand side was high and pay, well-known, well-famous architect. And they were introducing an international style internalizing a shopping center. This is Collins Place at the top of Collins Street. And the realization of the councillors of the day is if that carried on, the city they loved would be destroyed in, and changed uh, in a way that they didn't want. So they set about a strategy to uh, make sure that that didn't happen. And I'm dividing this up into uh, a few elements here. I think there's a very simple formula to making good cities. And if you achieve the eight things that are on the screen here now, you will get both economic outcomes, social outcomes and sustainability outcomes. So I'm gonna take you through some of those just as an illustration of how this has happened in Melbourne. And again, hopefully that'll be useful. So first we'll start with local character. I think it's important wherever you are that you don't try and make your city someone else's city. It has to be your city. It has to be of, of your, your place. And therefore you need to look for your local character. Melbourne used to compare itself with Sydney. And we said in 1985, we'll stop looking at Sydney. We'll just look at Melbourne and see what Melbourne's got to offer. And it comes down to some simple things, things like the paving uh, and the lanes and arcades that Melbourne had. So, you know, we did look at, at you know, simple uh, materials like this and we started to put in place um, what we called our tech notes. So every time we intervened in a street, we would use the characteristic material of Melbourne, which was the, the basalt, the bluestone. And what that meant is over time, uh, this is what we had in 1985 and people think of Melbourne as a bluestone paved city, but in 1985 it wasn't. There were a few elements around the city. But over time, if you start to use that every time a development takes place or you change a street, soon that becomes uh, the dominant character of the city. And so people now walk that city and think it's always been that way. And it gives us a good walking surface onto which uh, you know, many activities can take place. It also gives us the ability when someone goes in there, be it Telstra or someone else and cuts up the footpath, that we can find the exact material and replace it. And in a few months, you wouldn't know that anybody had been there. So it's about maintenance and long-term durability as well as the character of the place. The other part of the character of Melbourne was that uh, it's very large blocks, blocks that were laid out by a surveyor huddle were 200 meters by 200 meters. And then he put a 10 meter street through the middle, which made them 100 meters by 200. And what happened is the speculation of the 19th century saw the subdivision of those blocks into much smaller um, you know, blocks. And, and with that subdivision, you know, came things like the lanes and arcades that were necessary to access into the back of those. And that started to form the character of, of inner Melbourne. And then what was happening in the 20th century, and this is the IMP building again down the bottom, uh, you got the large interventions that were starting to lose that character that was Melbourne. So the 85 plan said, no, that's not what we want. Uh, you know, the streets we've had at the top of this slide, we don't want them turned into the streets we've got in the middle. And we will start to adapt, adapt them back to something that is more akin with Melbourne. And this is the sort of thing that happened. There were lanes obviously, and, but the nature of those changed. And we were very lucky. We, we, you know, through the system of subdivision in the 19th century, we had hundreds of lanes that we could start to use for other reasons. 
lanes that were used for cars suddenly became lanes that could be used for people. And now Melbourne is known for its laneway system. And it's interesting, Sydney came to us many years ago and said, how do we get a laneway um, strategy going? And the simple answer is, how many laneways have you got? And if you haven't got many, then it's very difficult to get that going. So this was something that was very Melbourne. The next two things we needed is we needed density and mixed use. So sitting there in, in 1985, we had a city that the heart was uh, starting to die. People had moved out to the suburbs. Chadston was being built. You had the suburban shopping centers. And we needed to bring people back to live in the city for two reasons. One, uh, it's the most sustainable thing to do if you can bring people close to where they're going to work. But also, if we could get more people living in the city, we would get more mixed use. So on the back of that, we started something called Postcode 3000. Um, and uh, it was basically in the strategy plan, we said we will get 8,000 8, units within 15 years. Um, I remember sitting in a room late at night on a Friday before the report had to go in for printing and writing that in. And I can say now that it wasn't based on any data. It was based on a gut feeling that if you got 8,000 units in the center of Melbourne, it would change the character. At that stage, we had no uh, uh, idea of how we would get there. So I really do think you need to be ambitious with some of your visions because the opportunities come along the way as to how you achieve them. If you know what you want, set it down and then set, set about trying to achieve it. What happened at the end of the 1980s, the property market crashed. A whole lot of buildings that uh, were occupied were vacated as people moved into those that had been built recently. And we saw the opportunity to put in place a program that would convert these to residential. And that was postcode 3000. What we did is cobble together a whole lot of things that already existed, subdivision laws uh, uh, and, and other things, and uh, basically put them in a package under this logo, postcode 3000. And that took off. And we saw buildings like this. This was a, a building that was deserted, Telstra's offices. And it was converted to residential. And under Katz Leedy's, one, one of the uh, leading architects, converted that. There, there were other developments as well. But what we saw from the 685 dwellings that we had in 1982, each one of those dots representing five, um, very quickly we started to generate. And we did. We hit the target of 8,000 uh, in that first 15 years. But it went past that. And, and that's another story. It's mostly gone too far. and. Uh, too many planning controls were lifted off um, residential as um, various governments drove, uh, you know, for jobs and uh, employment and uh, you know all the rest of it. And I think the, there's possibly been greater development that needed to be in the centre of Melbourne, but that's for another night. What came on the back of that was food and beverage. So once you have that many people living in the city. It changes the city completely. People are living there, they want food, they want beverages, they want supermarkets. So we had 602 food and beverage establishments in 1982. It went to 1900 by 2012. And that brings with it employment and excitement and activation. The same happened with retail. I said we were losing it to Chadston and we were down to 1900 retail establishments in 82. On the back of postcode 3000, we've got up back up to 2400. And now central Melbourne's not at the moment because of COVID, but a very strong retailing centre um, in, in Victoria. What comes off the back of that, which is of interest to, uh, I, I think, uh, many councils, is that the rate in the dollar dropped. At, at, when we started this in, back in 96, you can see it was about 13 cents in the dollar. And as you got more people paying those rates, it came right down. So it made, uh, made central Melbourne a more economical place to, in fact, trade. High quality public realm, I think urban design quite often is just about the, the, uh, the high quality public realm. And it is really important, but it's so much more than that. And, and the high quality public realm is where we spend most of our life. It's the, the space between buildings as defined by Jan Gell. And that really is the space that we need to look at. And there's a one liner that I've used, and that is that 80% of the public realm of a city is made up of streets. So if you design good streets, you design a good city. And you say, well, that couldn't be that hard. And it, it, it shouldn't. Uh, we all know what makes a good street. Uh, it's things like trees, it's generous footpaths, it's good street furniture, it's sidewalk cafes, 
all of those things that we instantly analyze as we walk around cities as being places we want to visit, we want to be part of. So the challenge is, how do we make that happen in the city? And I'll come back to that because one of the challenges was our city was dominated by cars and we wanted it to be more dominated by people. But this is a simple slide that shows the sorts of things we did. We took a little open space that was uh, on Swanton Street, uh, the slide on the left. We designed and through a public-private partnership, we didn't have the money. So we went out to the market and said, you know, we'll give a 30 year lease on this. And uh, we, you know, we were quite thankful we designed it and you get to run it. We cut a hole in the town hall, the slide on the right and opened up the town hall to the footpath. We put a flower stand on the corner and said he had to keep open until 10 o'clock at night in return for low rental. And all these incremental things were the things that slowly started to change the nature of the city. We took traffic islands and converted them to celebrations of our Chinese community at the top of Little Burke Street, up by Parliament. The city square was not, not functioning. Um, although it won many design competitions, it didn't have the key ingredient to public space, and that was activity around its edges. Public spaces are, are driven by the activity around the edges, not by the gymnastics of the architects and landscape architects for, uh, in the stuff that they put in the middle of them. Many public spaces are very simple spaces, um, but with good activity around them. So what we did is we decided to sell half of that square, reinvested in opening the Re Regent Theatre, which is uh, behind that blank wall at the back. And a hotel was built on that. It got slightly higher than we would have wanted. The, the minister of the day decided to give it uh, more height than was in the planning scheme. But what we created was a place where people could sit and it had activity around the edges so they could buy coffee, buy food, and they could use the space in a very casual way. And that really was the secret of much of what we did. We designed street furniture, so Melbourne's got its own range, it's not JC to co. And we, we started to give dignity to people who used public transport and um, you know, walk, walked our pavements, et cetera. And we used art, we used public art, both in a temporary basis in our lanes and arcades, or also as part of the infrastructure. So the second slide uh, from the left at the top was gonna be a Telstra duct and they gave us a concrete pipe and we said, no, you, you, you know, you can afford an artwork and they in the end designed that artwork, which is in fact a ventilation shaft for their underground facilities. So this whole thing of uh, artwork we used to open up the laneways. We, we started laneways commissions where we used to commission artworks and pay them about uh, 20 to $30,000 for six months installation in the lanes. And then we advertised it and people started to go down into the lanes and find them and discover them. And with that came the life in the lanes. But there was always a secret weapon that we, we had in our back pocket and that was coffee. Melbourne, as you know, is renowned for its coffee. Um, it's a bit of a religion here. And we said, well, as we improve the public realm, where do you have your coffee? And the answer is you had to start having it on the sidewalks, in cafes, and you had to offer other things in the streets, fruit, um, you know, flowers, newspapers, et cetera. Back in 1980, there were two sidewalk cafes. You can see them highlighted by the arrows there. By 2014, there were 534. Under COVID, we had 800 applications to put new sidewalk cafes in, many of which have gone in on a temporary basis. And that, that brought life to the street. The people were now, Melbourne was no longer this cold place that you couldn't sit on the street. Melbourne is a place where you could sit on the, on the street and have coffee and enjoy yourself. We also started to plant trees. And one of the easiest way to change and improve the amenity of a city is to plant trees. So we, we, every place we could find a tree to plant, we planted Swanson Street, the trees in the foreground used to be there, but the trees in the, in the distance, that's Swanson Street. And that was 1992, those trees were planted. And now they're almost touching across the street. These are the trees we planted between 92 and 2002 in the central city. So people look at Melbourne now as a green city, but it was never always that way. The furniture we designed was bespoke. It was, uh, we had fun with it. Many of it was practical uh, in terms of how people rest their back as they're sitting down. But that little rail there also stopped skateboarders from jumping over um, what would have been a dangerous site for them to jump over. <clears throat> and there was certain furniture that we, as I say, had some fun with. Connectivity. 
How do people get around the city? It's such a, 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 a simple word, but it goes to universal access, it goes to the modes of transport, it goes to all those things. So we started to work through the city uh, with you know, you know, ramps at every intersection, um, you know, tactile tiles for you know, partially sighted people, bringing back bikes, um, giving priority to trams. And through that connectivity, we, we, the major turning point was in 92, when we closed Swanson Street to cars and gave it over to trams, bikes, and pedestrians. Controversial uh, at the time, um, but in fact, what happened, the street was dying in 92. Um, people did not shop at 60 kilometers an hour going through a, a street. They shopped by walking past a shop front, being attracted to it and walking in. And so what happened, is that the pedestrian numbers once it was closed dropped uh, and uh, rose from 12,800 between 10 in the morning and 6 at night to 47,000 by 2017. And really, the street changed. Fundamentally, this became a very busy street, an international street. It's written up by Bloomberg as one of the interesting streets. Yet it wasn't total pedestrianisation. There was still space in there for service vehicles, some cars, but more space for people. Bike lanes became part of that as well. We put in an extensive uh, network of bike lanes. Uh, we've started to dedicate those bike lanes to pedestrians, uh, more so under COVID. We've done a, a rapid rollout. And then there's the process. If that's how you're going to change the city, how do you bring the public with you? Public participation. It's not just town hall meetings anymore. It's got to be digital. It's got to be something that everybody can be part of. And one of the examples is uh, when we had the Millennium Drought in 2000, and uh, I had parks and gardens in my portfolio at that time, and I was devastated by what I was seeing happen to our trees in Melbourne. Um, I, when I first arrived in Melbourne, I lived just across Faulkner Park, and I used to obviously go through Faulkner Park the whole time. When I visited Faulkner Park in, in uh, the early 2000s, the elms were dying. So avenues of elms were dying. And you just thought, no, there's got to be a solution to this. So we, we put in place this uh, urban forest strategy and open space strategy. And we did a survey of all the trees. And uh, the sad thing was that we were going to lose 48% of our trees in 20 years if we didn't do something about it. And that combined a whole lot of things. That combined a strategy that looked at how do you increase the canopy cover? Um, how do you increase, you know, the diversity, uh, improve the vegetation, health? How do you get uh, moisture into the soil? All of which would be part of this. We didn't talk about trees. We didn't talk about species. This was not a discussion about should it be exotic or should it be indigenous. Because if you'd started that discussion, you might not have ended it and you wouldn't have ended up with a strategy. We talked about the outcomes we want in terms of number, health, etc. And then when people adopted that, uh, the council adopted that strategy and people were on board, we put in place this app, which is the Urban Forest app. So if you're in Melbourne, you can get it on your phone. And as you walk past any tree in the city, you can identify it. It'll give you its age, its genus, its life expectancy. We also gave it an email number, and that was mainly for our data keeping. But um, what happened is people started emailing our trees. And this became the best common strategy that we had. I remember the time wondering about the wisdom of allowing my staff to spend time replying to emails to trees, but we did. And uh, this went viral. We, we got something like 30 million hits um, around the world. We had, um, I mean, oaks in North America emailing our oaks in Melbourne. And here's one that you can see, which is all about, you know, water and uh, the health of a tree. The other thing that's important is integrated action that everybody is pulling in the same direction, um, be it you know, local government, state government, federal government, the community, private sector. And that was important because if you're not pulling in the same direction, um, you know, it's, it's inefficient. And one of the strategies that we uh, encountered again in about the year 2000 was, how do we get more water into our city? How do we actually keep our water? Because really, as you can see from this graph, we were getting less rainfall. It was coming sometimes in, in, in greater uh, drops, but uh, it was less uh, in, in volume. So we started building very simple retention. We built this wetland in uh, Royal Park that collected all the water that came down from Brunswick and, and purified it. 
Um, we started putting medians down the center of the street. We'd started that already a long time before, but we just accelerated that. And so we got, gave more permeability to our streets. And then we strategically located these tanks, which, uh, uh, water tanks, which are shown as the black asterisks there. And they were located downhill of the contours that flowed down to the Yarra River. And their job was twofold, not only to store water, but to stop the overland flow as you had a heavy downpour. So we could empty a tank um, if we knew there was gonna be a heavy storm, fill it up during the storm, and that way just slow down that overland flow. And this was highly successful. We took water straight off the street, as you can see on this right-hand slide, dropped it into a tree pit. So the tree pit, the tree's about 600 millimeters below ground there, which meant the tree pit filled up with water. The water got into the, the soil before it got into the pipe. So our challenge was, how do you keep it out of the pipe for as long as possible? Because if you stick it in a pipe, you're taking it somewhere else and you're not using it where you need it. One of the controversial projects was uh, in our Fitzroy Gardens, some, uh, most probably one of our most important heritage gardens. And um, being in charge of parks and gardens, I suggested that we could take the depot and we could uh, dig a five million liter tank in the depot and we could rationalize the depot. And that's what we did. You see the depot here on the left-hand side, and that was as it used to exist. And it was a hod hodgepodge of a depot that had grown up over uh, you know, decades. And we just rationalized it. And we got the same efficiency out of the depot, but we needed less space. Then we built a cafe that went with Cook's Cottage. And, and we built uh, the tank, which is under this green area here. This is where the water is purified in a rain garden here. This is the cafe. This is Cook's Cottage. And basically what we had done there is we had actually saved the money of buying land for open space. We had new gardens that uh, you know, were 4,000 extra square meters and we had our stormwater. And we got about 70 to 80% of the water we needed to uh, flow back, you know, to use back on the gardens. So we started putting tanks on the streets. This is near Darling Gardens. There was a, a, a rain garden above where it was purified and then we used the water back in those gardens. The final thing that uh, you need to do in a city is be able to adapt it. And this I think is one of the most exciting challenges. And I'm just gonna show you central Melbourne, but uh, on another occasion, we might talk about how you adapt a metro area. And there's a report um, we wrote about 10 years ago called Transforming Australian Cities. So if you just do Transforming Australian Cities, Rob Adams, it'll come up. And that looks at how you adapt a whole metro area. But this was about how do you adapt our city? And I've shown you a few of them, postcode 3000 and the water. But this is about a project I, I call Grey Degree. Back in 1985, when we put the play, uh, plan in place, if we'd gone out and said, we're going to start taking asphalt away from the motor car as a way of getting more area for pedestrians, they would have stopped us. So we didn't. We just started to incrementally take space away from the motor car. Very small scale to start off with. These are some of the bigger projects that have come more recently. But where a road wasn't needed and where open space was needed, and, and one here is near high density housing on the left, where you can see the street running off into the distance, and that's become an active recreation area. The slide was taken early in the morning, as you can see from the shadows, so there weren't too many people there, unfortunately. The other one in the middle was a 500 square meter roundabout. Um, we uh, did a one-way system around it and created a 5,000 square meter pond. That saved us $14 million in buying land. And one of the things with the open space strategy we had worked out is that the open space we needed for our population would have cost us 700 million to buy. We did not have that money. So if we could actually take it from places like streets and surface level car parks and things like that, it became a much more reasonable proposition. And over the last 30 years, we've taken 80 hectares of asphalt out of the central city and turned it over to widened footpaths, tree planting and open space. There weren't all um, roads uh, with uh, Federation Square, which was a joint project between ourselves and the state. We approached the Premier the day and said, what if we take back um, you know, some of the rail yards? So back in 1986, when we had just completed the strategy plan, you can see an aspirational drawing there. And the aspirational drawing on the right is that the gardens to the east of Melbourne that surround this whole eastern edge of the gardens could in fact become linked up. And we could decrease the number of rail lines that we've got there 
and create more open space. We only needed 12 running lines uh, for the, the, the transport system to, to operate. And uh, the Premier of the day was Jeff Kennett, and that's exactly what happened. He said, I'll take away the trains, you pay for the park. And uh, pretty much that's what happened. So this is Burrung Ma today. It was uh, designed as an events park, hence some of the hard surfacing, and you can see the tent in there. And it, it, it really also reflected some of the period of change that had happened there, you know, where the waterways used to be, where the old platforms used to be. And it became um, the link between the city um, and, and the river. As we talked there, 10 maybe more projects going into the ground. Uh, we've closed part of Market Street and we, we're putting in this uh, park, which is actually now completed during COVID. Um, we, we're closing half of South Bank Boulevard. Um, we, we started with streets like Ligon Street. We're simply widening the, the footpath and putting a median down the middle, gave more space for people. And that program has run out across the municipality. We widened footpaths in the central city. So these in our little streets, we took the parking off one side of uh, the street and we allocated that to footpaths. So people had more, uh, more dignity in the way they used the footpaths. Our budget today has an allowance for 300 car parking spaces to be removed from the central city each year to provide extra space for bike lanes, pedestrians, widened footpaths. That's a major consideration and revenue that you would have got from car parking but you get it back in so many other ways. And that's a decision that's been made by council that the cars do not dominate the city. The people need to dominate it. This is South Bank Boulevard. <laughs> this was a street that used to carry 30,000 people. For the Commonwealth Games, we, uh, as a legacy project, we closed the bottom of South Bank Boulevard where it hits the Yarra River. Sandridge Bridge goes across there and we created an open space, which was part of, as I say, legacy for the Commonwealth Games. Having closed the end of it, the traffic in that street dropped down to 15,000, which means you only need half the space. So we then took everything that is yellow and green and blue here and said, we'll turn it into open space. And this is in an area of very high density um, you know, living. You can go back and you can see the population here without a lot of open space. And this was the only way we were gonna get that open space. We were taking it from the streets. It was about turning roads like this into places where people could sit and enjoy it. This is the first stage, which is outside two of the theatres there, and hence it's hard paved. And the rest is currently under construction and will be finished in about 12 months time. We planted in, in the middle of the uh, tramway to again, help get water down into the subsoil. And there've been many projects. I'll end very quickly by just saying, there's a whole raft of sustainability projects we could talk about, and you can see them listed there. Um, all the buildings we build as a city are now six star, green star rated and, and uh, you know, highly environmental. Our office building CH2, interestingly during COVID, and I haven't made too much of a push on this because it might discourage people about going back to the central city, but it's the only building in the city where the air comes from below you and goes out above you. And it's drawn up by the heat of your body and your computer. So when you're sitting in that building, you're sitting in fresh air. And the person next to you is not sharing your germs as the conventional air, air conditioning system circulates the air around that building. And that's something for us to think about as we come out of COVID. What does the office environment look like in the future? Because the way we actually ventilate our buildings at the moment is not a healthy environment. Dr. Anne's library built completely out of cross laminated timber. Uh, the East Melbourne Library on the right-hand side used ground heat source um, to help it with its heating and cooling. And this bowling club up at Flagstaff Gardens has heat sourcing pipes rolled out under the bowling green that help uh, heat and cool it. So those are some of the lessons. This is a childcare we just opened in the last couple of days, which also uses ground source uh, uh, for its um, work. That's a very quick um, tour through what we've done. And uh, I thank you for the opportunity and uh, really hope you've got something out of this. Thanks very much. Rob, on behalf of everybody here tonight, thank you very much. As a Councillor of the City of Launceston, I'm not sure that you've helped me or hindered me, uh, but um, the reality of it is there's some fantastic 
programs that you put in place. I did have the pleasure, you won't remember, I met you about three or four years ago with Bruce McIsaac. And, uh, I do remember. And, uh, and we had a, a wonderful uh, couple of hours with you talking about many of the things that you've just expressed here tonight. Um, one of the things in Lawn System we're not very good at is driving past the place we want to park. Uh, we actually need to park in front of it, so maybe there's some lessons and hopefully there's some disciples that will walk out of this room tonight and say so we don't need the amount of parking we've got in Central Lawn System. I noticed the, in here... The one parking spot, councillor, that you can get right outside every building is a bike spot. Absolutely. And uh, I'm also the chair of the Pedestrian and Bike Committee and I noticed some of my committee members are here tonight and uh, they would be loving some of the readaptation, reuse and get rid of the pavement and make it into, into, into pedestrian and bike way friendly places. So um, there's some fantastic things there and I, I won't say that Launceston City isn't doing any of the things that you have stated because I think we are adapting a number of the things that you've talked about um, but you know certainly you've given us plenty more food for thought and uh, I'm very uh, pleased that I have a number of officers from the City of Launceston in the room tonight as well who've had the chance to listen to your uh, your great uh, great talk tonight so on behalf of everybody here thank you very much for sharing your knowledge your wisdom with us it's been a a fantastic uh, presentation, so thank you very much. Thank you, enjoy the rest of the evening. Now, I, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm thinking Rob might come back um, in a little while to join us in the uh, in the panel presentation, but uh, so I hope you all got a lot out of that. I certainly did, I always do when I listen to people like that, very inspiring. Now, we're about to listen to another inspiring person who is actually here in person. Um, so I'm just going to introduce you to, to Lucy Burke-Smith. Uh, Lucy is a registered architect uh, with postgraduate qualifications in heritage conservation. She has over 18 years experience in the management and delivery of complex large scale conservation projects and extensive experience as a participant in and a leader of multidisciplinary teams. During her extensive career in government, Lucy was responsible for ensuring quality design and conservation outcomes for the significant heritage precinct of the rocks in Sydney and for the Port Arthur Historic Site. Lucy is based in Hobart as an associate partner with Purcell, an international architecture and heritage consultancy practice, and was jury chair for the 2020 Australian Institute of Architects Tasmania Awards. So tonight Lucy will dem be dem demonstrating how our older buildings can be reinvigorated to serve and become active parts of our communities, highlighting the social, economic and environmental benefits of adaptive reuse and regeneration. So I'd like to introduce Lucy. Thank you. Thank you for having me tonight. I really enjoy visiting, visiting Launceston. It's a beautiful city, so it's nice to be back. Um, as Rob mentioned, uh, I've been working in this specialism for quite some time. And when I was asked to prepare this presentation, I wanted to go beyond the norm of putting up some beautiful slides of old buildings and adaptive reuse projects for um, what's usually a room full of architects and really bring some, I guess, statistics and some background to why these sorts of projects are important. And I must say, it was a bit of a challenge for me to look at it through that lens because I've just always intuitively seen the value in it, but it's important to be able to back that value up with some interesting, um, I guess, uh, you know, a basis and, and a substantiated argument. So. The projects that I've chosen today um, have, have been successful drivers for sustainable and economic growth in their communities. Um, and they've ensured that the community and social values have been reaffirmed through community identity. So we'll be looking at both some large scale public projects, but also some granular initiatives that are being implemented internationally to reactivate cities um, and townships. So this is the site of the Red Ruth Brewery, or the former Red Ruth Brewery, which is in Cornwall in the United Kingdom. The brewery operated for about 200 years before it closed in 2005. So it was quite a large local employer in a town, small community of about 14,000 people. So the site following the closure of the brewery fell into disrepair um, and had been subject to a couple of arson attacks. And as you can imagine, both the closure of the brewery and the neglect of the site uh, had a huge impact on the community, both economically and socially. So this all happened at, 
around the time that council were looking to centralise some of their archival functions and they were looking for a site for a state-of-the-art modern archive and library. Council called for site nominations and it was the former employees of the Red Ruth Brewery who put forward a very impassioned proposal for the adaptive reuse of the site. The project was completed in 2020 to a value of £6.5 million, which equates to about $31 million, and it was fortunate to enough to have heritage lottery funding. So the exterior form of the building retains a lot of the qualities of the former brew house, and there's been careful consideration of the fenestration of both new and historic features um, and insertions. Importantly, the chimney stack has been retained uh, as a bit of a beacon for the city, and a public art installation interprets uh, the important link to the social and community associations representing the brewers and former workers of the site. The material selection for the project um, has been really considered <coughs> with regard to concrete panels, copper cladding, um, and they stand as robust yet discrete additions that highlight still the historic buildings. Together with the reconstru reconstructed slate roof, these materials have been intended to support a really generous life cycle for this building as an important public contribution. Through the project, we sought to retain um, as much of the extant fabric as we could. And so a lot of the masonry has been reused. We're talking 600, just over half a metre um, wide walls. Cast iron columns have been retained, and some of the granite um, sandstone, or sorry, the granite um, flagstones throughout the building, which are quite large, have been lifted and redressed and flipped for reuse. This gives you a bit of a sense as to how big a collection the site holds and how big a contribution it makes to the community more broadly. So the project delivers public research and learning spaces, exhibitions. Importantly, it's a new archive store for over 1.5 million manuscripts, maps and documents and thousands of other photographs, books and newspapers. The design brief um, allows for a further 30 years of archival accrual, which is pretty important for such um, a significant uh, repository of information as this. And I was quite fascinated that that equates to 22.5 kilometres of archival shelving. So this is where it got interesting for me to analyse some of the statistics. The project was a big economic driver for the community. It generated 11 local construction jobs, just remembering the size of the community itself, and supported wider industry placement and training. It's a reflection of the stimulus and catalyst that these projects can have. And it's been estimated that with the broader master plan being completed for the entire site, that it will be worth £40 million, or 75.3 million Australian dollars to the community. And that it's forecast to deliver an additional 300 jobs in the community. Some of these jobs may be those from families that have lost theirs through the closure of the brewery and had been intergenerational employees. 96% of the construction material for the project was recycled and there's been a pretty impressive um, diversion of carbon emissions through the reuse of that facade that we spoke of, the columns, the masonry and other elements. Skipping forward to Cardigan Castle, this is in Wales. My Welsh is dreadful, so please forgive me if you, I stumble over uh, any names and terminology. This um, ancient monument uh, site has six Grade two listed buildings that sit within its curtain walls. It fell into disrepair in the early 20th century and was derelict by the 1970s. It was in such a poor state that the streets around the castle had to be closed um, and the walls had to be propped. The project began with a feasibility study and this was an important move. So rather than pushing an intended use onto a place, we were engaged to look at what the potential um, opportunities for the place were. And again, this is another project. Both of these projects have been those that have been driven by councils together with communities. And so the options analysis, importantly, had to balance um, economical, um, economically viable uses and compatible uses. Mm. It was determined that for this particular community of just over 4,100 people, that was um, just prior to completion, it may, it may have increased since then, 
um, that visitor attraction um, with revenue generation coming from commercial holiday lets, food and beverage events and the like, together with the heritage centre and educational facilities was the best fit. A focus on like-for-like -like traditional um, repairs um, and uh, conservation helped to sustain local suppliers and there was a procurement decision made to source labour and materials within a 50-mile mi radius of the site. So flexible spaces were sought, and so in each instance, spaces were looked at and the question was asked, could this be used for other functions? And if so, how does that influence the architectural intervention? Exhibition spaces double as meeting rooms, holiday lets become accommodation for function delegates, um, and food and beverage has got flexibility to be used for a range of different events, upscaling, downscaling, daytime, evening and the like. Careful consideration was given to some of those bolder and high intensity interventions, um, that being hospitality in this case, which is often the case when you're trying to fit some of those uses in. And there was a particular section of the, um, the curtain walling that had already collapsed. And so this provided us with an opportunity to insert some pretty prominent and emblematic new additions, uh, which also give the opportunity for visitors uh, to get a sense that there's the sign of a new experience. The castle are using as their marketing tag at the moment that our next moment in history is yours. I kind of like that. So during construction, this particular project um, delivered an 8.5 million pound or 16 million Australian dollar contract spend in the town. That looks like 600 bed nights for contractors and consultants. It's 7,000 takeaway lunches that I'm assured are broken down into 4,000 Indian takeaway meals and 3,000 um, BLTs. Uh, 90 construction jobs, uh, a really important community initiative and indeed a cost-saving exercise for the Trust being a volunteer scheme of excavation over a five-year period involving 13,000 volunteer days and 400 participants for um, uh, archaeology scheme as well. Since completion in 2005, the project has delivered 45,000 visitors with a local spend of £2.6 million per annum. 6,000 events, I'm sure they haven't had that many recently, um, but new income, I thought this was a really interesting one, new income to um, Cardigan per inhabitant, so you're talking about that 4,100 odd people, um, of 2,200 odd Australian dollars, which is 15% of their average local income at the time. So you might ask, why is all of this important? Every construction job yields um, economic value. Construction is such a big driver in all of our economies and stimuluses. How is it any different for adaptive reuse and conservation? It's not quite as simple as that. So I found quite an interesting, thing, an interesting paper in 2008 from the National Trust for Historic Preservation. That's um, a US publication that said, dollar for dollar, rehabilitation creates more jobs than new construction. There was an additional study that found that for every $1 million in rehabilitation, and that's um, US dollars in this instance, there are nine to 13 more jobs than the same spend for a new build. So the president of the National Trust in the United States goes on to point out that rehabilitation activities are more labour intensive than new construction. And that I think equates for some of that increase in, um, in job days there. So more man hours, fewer materials. This also has implications for sustainable development. The Preservation Green Lab, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, also a US company, indicated that studies are showing building reuse creating better paying jobs than new construction and naturally these dollars sort of circulate through the economy. So not only are they better paying jobs, but there are jobs that people are holding for longer. Moving through to the other two infographics, Historic England's uh, research has indicated that the heritage sector is worth £13 billion to the English economy. I think this was 2018. Um, 
and that, put quite simply, adaptive reuse projects keep money circulating in the economy. And that's reflected by um, the $13 billion figure there. Beyond that, and that's all the money stuff, and I know that the money stuff is really important, but there's the other stuff. The green economy, where we know, again, that those more labour-intensive jobs, less material-intensive jobs are driving that green economy. But more importantly, I think it's, uh, we can't overlook the intangible benefits. So projects such as these are really the threads of our communities. Large projects can be catalysts for this change um, and are really opportunities for those communities. They enable communities to consider the finer grain of our cities beyond these big civic gestures. And that's why I wanted to take the opportunity uh, to quickly talk about some initiatives in the UK that are targeted regeneration of the high street. So recent vacancy rates uh, within towns are increasing due to online shopping and retail parks. And that was something that our previous speaker spoke about. This has been further accelerated by the pandemic, but I thought that these um, statistics were interesting because they were before the pandemic. So in 2019, a UK publication predicted that internet shopping would increase to account for more than half of all sales by 2028. And that in 2020, the British Property Federation predicted that half of all town centre shops would close over the following two year period. We're pretty close to that. Now, unfortunately, this trend's pretty wide-reaching, and we see that locally within your community with the closure of Birchall and Sons on Brisbane Street a number of years ago, after 170 years of trading, and more recently with the closure of shops, um, some of the chains such as Typo and Michael Hill and the like. So some of the initiatives that are being rolled out in the UK are heritage action zones. And heritage action zones in and of themselves look to take declining high streets which are on Historic England's Heritage at Risk Register and to open up a bidding process for $95 million worth of heritage lottery funding for reactivation projects. These projects are really targeted at creating that economic growth within these communities and improving the environmental quality of these towns to make sure that they're clean and green and safe and that they're conducive to social interaction. There are also similar funding projects, such as the Future High Streets program, which we're involved with at Tamworth uh, at the moment, which beyond the high street and the regeneration of shop fronts and signage and fenestration and the like, take the opportunity to really link through some of those larger civic projects, such as those we looked at earlier in the presentation, um, and looking at the master planning of cities to link these through uh, to, I guess, get enhanced benefits out of that exercise. So this particular master plan that we're working on seeks to deliver transformational change through a diversification of use. So we're looking at leisure, educational, business, residential uses, that sort of mixed use that we really need to be encouraging to get the balance that we need for our communities. And, of course, that will result in encouraging yeah. residents, investors and visitors to be occupying and interacting with these spaces at all times of day. So that's about it for the presentation, except that I thought that this may be a bit of a light-hearted way to end the talk, in that I figure if Donald Trump can see the value in all of this, then there's got to be something in it. <laughs> and that was it from me. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Lucy, thank you so much. And I think just combining the two uh, presentations we've had thus far and just trying to look at it from a lawn system perspective, I look at it, yes, there are things we still have to learn, but there are a number of things that we're actually doing. If you look in the city, the ability of you know, bringing, to, you know, bringing more residences into the city, which is part of the Melbourne strategy, part of the repurposing that I think you were showing up there in Tamworth, um, puts more people on the streets, actually activates the city's more... We're lucky, as everybody keeps saying, we're having a fantastic built heritage here in Launceston and try to preserve that and make sure that we go forward. Uh, I'm sure over many, many years we've made mistakes in regards to buildings that are no longer there, uh, which I'm sure many in this room can recount. I would suggest that probably in today's environment that's much more unlikely to occur. 
uh, and that the adapting and reuse of buildings in and around the city is something that I think we as a heritage committee, we as a city council are certainly very much uh, uh, you know, working towards ensuring that those, uh, those, those built heritage things are preserved. And it's readapting and reusing and looking at the environment that we're living in. Uh, the statistic on internet shopping isn't going away and it's not just peculiar to England. Um, it's certainly something that resonates here and today we passed uh, some buildings to be built uh, over on Invermay, which are big box developments, which again challenges uh, city residential, uh, city CBD shopping type precincts. So the issue is what do we do going forward and a number of the things I'm pleased to say Launceston are considering, uh, how quickly we get to those things um, uh, is yet to, be, yet to be determined but certainly a number of the things that have been uh, presented here tonight are things that are certainly very much on the conscience of, of the Launceston City Council so I'm really pleased that we are engaging with that process but today and tonight is something about learning more and picking up more things that we can take on. So uh, thank you very much for that uh, fantastic presentation, Lucy. Um, now we're moving to the panel discussion and I'd just like to introduce uh, Dr Julian Worrell to facilitate the discussion panel. Uh, Julian is a Professor of Architecture and Head of School of Architecture and Design at the University of Tasmania. His career has spanned scholarly research and education critical writing and design practice, a registered architect. His practice career has encompassed work with prominent architectural practices in Japan and the Netherlands, and he maintains an ongoing design consultancy. With a PhD from the University of Tokyo and specific expertise in the architectural and urban history of Japan, his research inquiries encompass temporarily, uh, temporality, sorry, uh, publicness, displacement and mediation in contemporary architecture and urbanism. A widely published critic, he is a prominent exponent of urban and architectural innovation sourced in the study of built environment of East Asia. So I'd like to welcome Julian to the podium to introduce his panel. Thank you, Councillor Mackenzie, and, and it's great to be here and wonderful to be on this uh, on this occasion, which I, I, I um, feel um, can stimulate some really um, new energies, I think, in Launceston, I hope. Um, so today, um, in addition to our wonderful two speakers, uh, we also have um, uh, three uh, additional guests, um, Pippa Jensen, Leila Olbrook, and Dom Gerrity. Um, Dom Gerrity maybe needs no introduction to this audience, or perhaps he may do. He is um, the university's pro vice chancellor, uh, the academic lead responsible for the driving delivery of the northern transformation vision uh, and strategic objectives for the city and the region. And you know, it's happening around us uh, on this site. Uh, originally from Ireland, uh, where he obtained a BSc Honours from the National University of Ireland, he completed a PhD at Deakin University in 1988. Dom moved to the University of Tasmania in 1991, has become complete, uh, completely or deeply connected with the university and the Launceston region, researching and teaching for over three decades. The first in his family to attend university is passionate about growing the university's presence and increasing educational access and attainment and is also currently a director on the board of Business Events Tasmania. So that's Dom. Um, maybe if our guests can come up to sit um, at the front as I read your introductions. Um, and um, moving back uh, through our list, we have uh, Leila Albrook. Leila is an architect and principal at Albrook Architecture who returned to Tasmania after working on a heritage restoration an adaptive reuse project in Myanmar in uh, late 19, uh, 2019. After graduating in 2006, worked in Victoria with Williams Bogue Architects and Preston Lane Architects, predominantly on educational and community and bespoke residential projects. While in Victoria, she also taught at Monash University uh, in the architecture and interior architecture design and technology subjects, and focused on architectural academic support to international students. Passionate about our built environment, the role it plays in the identity of place and how culture and the individual inform it, Leila's focus has been on placemaking 
through adaptive reuse and collaborative engagement processes. So, Leila, you're there. Um, and uh, Pippa. Pippa Jensen is a registered architect and associate with Cumulus Studios uh, Launceston team. Uh, Pippa considers the Tasmanian context when she builds from natural materials that will patina well in the elements to those made by a local supplier. For Pippa, finding ways to be sustainable and support local both form instinctive parts of her practice woven into how she approaches a brief. In 2020, Pippa won the Tasmanian Emerging Architects Prize to the surprise of nobody but herself. Uh, recognised by the judges for raising awareness for women's architectural contributions with the Finlay project, they described Pippa as an approachable, tenacious practitioner. Her growing portfolio demonstrates this astute ascent, attention to detail and collaborative design approach. She's also an active member of the Australian Institute of Architects Chapter Council to the North. So I'd like everyone to welcome our panellists. Um, So uh, what I'd like to do is actually make it a little less formal and take a seat uh, and um, take a mic and we'll, we'll run it that way. So um, pick up a wine and, and sit back and, and, uh, and what I'd like to do to start with, to kick our, uh, ourselves off, is we've just heard um, two really um, stimulating presentations uh, and I'd like um, each of our um, panellists uh, to uh, reflect on those presentations and uh, in the case of uh, uh, Lucy, uh, maybe on Rob's presentation um, and, and, and pick up uh, just one or two things that really st struck you um, and that you think has particular significance to our situation here in Launceston, uh, perhaps through um, projects or initiatives that you have had personal experience with. And then with that, we'll be able to, I think, launch into um, uh, a discussion around some of those themes. So maybe, Pippa. Sure. <laughs> um, well, thank you firstly to Rob and Lucy for those great presentations. Um, I think they're very inspiring and um, very important conversations to be starting to have. The key thing um, about both presentations, the same sort of theme within both for me was that um, all of these projects and whether it's a citywide or an individual project, it's about having strategy and values and um, those strategies and values which I think um, the City of Launceston by holding events like these are working towards um, are so important, um, coupled with time and appreciation that um, the implementation of these strategies take time um, and it's not going to happen overnight. But like Melbourne as an example that Rob demonstrated, small implementation over time can have really um, excellent effects on community and quality of life. Yeah. Thank you. Leila. Does it, does it work? <laughs> um, so I particularly liked Rob's because I lived in Melbourne for such a long time and was there when it started changing. And I think it's really... I think the, the thing that is interesting for Launceston is that it started changing when they embraced Melbourne as Melbourne, not, not as anything else. And I think we've already got a really strong identity here and if we embrace it, then I think it, it can just be enhanced more and more. We don't need to actually sort of look further afield to the, uh, for the identity. It's already here. It's just about those strategies. Um, and I think, with Lucy, with yours, it was... Um, it's really that economic... So in Myanmar, the, all those economic things were part of the project. It was about um, building capacity in the workforce there and, and bringing jobs and making sure that the, the financial side of it stayed within the city um, and we weren't sort of employing people outside of, the, the, of that country and building up their capacity to then work on other projects. But what was nice about yours is that 
that works in non-developing places as well. So that is a really clear example that it, that can work here in building the skills of our labourers as well. So it's not just new builds that we can have highly skilled tradespeople that might end up working on other projects around Australia as well. Um, so I think that was those were the things that I sort of took out of those two. I think the labour aspect is a very interesting one, actually, in skills and uh, how that relates to local economies and, and, and also local um, local pride. Um, Dom. Um, thanks, Julian. Um, I, I am not an architect, as I said. In fact, I feel as if I've walked into a, an architect's anonymous meeting. You know, <laughs> my name's Dominic. I haven't been to an architect for at least three wait, three days. Um, <laughs> but I suppose the single the single take home message from particularly from Rob was earlier on was the idea that if you're going to adapt buildings, they need to be adapted to increased vibrancy, to increase the number of people. And obviously, all the examples that were provided by both speakers talks about this idea of when we create, recreate, re, reconnect connect with the buildings, it has to bring more people into those spaces. It's all about people for you, Dom, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, Lucy, if you were thinking, reflecting on Rob's um, kind of, I think he had, what was it, nine uh, or ten principles uh, that uh, I think... At the start, he said, this is the recipe. Follow the recipe and you'll get a good city. Um, I was just wondering, um, thinking about Tasmania and Launceston, perhaps. Um, I know you're in Hobart, but um, which uh, elements of, of that recipe resonates particularly for you? The two that immediately sprang to mind when you first asked the question were um, that it's a long game and that it's about community identity. And our panellists have already picked up on those things. And so that, that leading back to the recipe is just supported by the really strategic thinking that's required to make the recipe, because when the cake's baked, you get those outcomes. Um, I, I, I was particularly taken by uh, the photograph of the trees down the boulevard where, you know, you talk about people's associations and, and um, recollections of Melbourne being a very green city. It hasn't always been like that. Launceston is a very green city um, it, and you, you forget quite quickly how uh, some of those key, key, decision made, key decisions made at key points can really transform a place. So, I mean, Launceston's just got so many fabulous qualities and it's got such a fabulous and active community that there are so many of those ingredients already there. Um, and, you know, there is, there is from, from what I can see, commitment to see that, um, those, those principles baked or that recipe baked into that cake, and I think that's really encouraging. Yes, uh, for me, uh, I think the two that, uh, that leapt out was uh, that great proposition and simple idea that um, great streets make great cities, uh, and that the the public um, the public realm of the of of the city is is uh, to a great extent in its streets, um, and streets have for so many years now been largely the province of automobiles mm -hmm. for the past century or more, um, and so uh, that by incrementally working on the streets, and this was the second thing, was the, the accumulation of small, um, well-directed changes can, over that long game, uh, really uh, change a place and, and, in fact, create something quite new. And I think this, uh, this goes to um, another theme that I'd like to explore is indeed the relationship between the new and the old. Um, maybe I'll put this back to you, Lucy, because uh, what, what was not talked about so much in Rob's presentation, I think, was um, the uh, question of heritage architecture or, alternatively, contemporary architecture, the actual uh, nature and qualities of the buildings themselves as opposed to the spaces between the buildings. Um, I'm curious to get your reflections. Obviously, I think for many of us in the room, we recognise Melbourne as a place that has lots of um, buildings that have, uh, let's say, sparkling personas. Um, they, uh, they, they Instagram well. 
Um, but of course, also a layer of um, significant um, and uh, beautiful heritage mm. buildings. Given that, um, how significant is the heritage dimension to the construction of or the, the creation of, of a rich, enriched new city? Mm. Um, could also the, uh, the sparkling um, baubles of uh, contemporary architecture also be equally as contributory to that aspect? They absolutely can. And I don't think that we um, should speak of heritage architecture and contemporary architecture as being two mutually exclusive things. I like to consider it more as heritage conservation and architecture. Heritage conservation being the practice of ensuring the long-term conservation of our buildings through a really sound understanding of conservation practice and materials conservation, traditional trade skills, and architecture being purely that. It is the process of, of new interventions and new designs. The two do have their nuances, uh, but one assumes no change when the other is always a driving force for change. And change needs to be delivered to ensure that these places remain viable contributions to our community and significant places for our um, memories. And so I think that there needs to be a distinction between the two in that they're not two, they're one, and that they run in parallel with the practice of conservation. Pippa, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I think it's a really good... Um, a really interesting topic um, and I think the larger part of the conversation is cultural heritage and the way that that is a much bigger part of our overall history and the way that we consider our environment and the landscape moving forward needs to all be intertwined into the conversation and the decision um, making process of when we are making architectural interventions. So I think we're really talking about a kind of continuum here, um, not an oppositional setup, but a but a, a conversation um, that can enrich uh, the, the 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 urban life and 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 character of of a place. Leila, do you have a thought on this? Yeah, I was just um, thinking. You know, that the buildings that we consider heritage were. Uh, are still there because they were really good examples of that time of architecture, and they were built. They were they're they're of a really strong quality. So, it they're all. They're, it's, it yeah, it's a continuum. But they're sort of each. They're they're indications of each stage. So that's, I don't. If you're sort of. It's that cultural heritage that if you're sort of wiping it away, it's sort of like starting again from a clean slate. And why are you starting with a clean slate when something is sort of, it's good quality? Like it, it wouldn't be there if it wasn't of good quality. So, um, yeah, I sort of, yeah, it's a continuum. It has value. Yeah, it has value, yeah. It, it's, it, it, otherwise, you're sort of always starting again and... Yeah, yeah, I've seen cities where they're, they're new cities and they really struggle to kind of find a direction until they've got those quality buildings in and, the, the, and that they indicate that period of time and this period of time and, yeah. Well, just, just there, you may have got it, I'm not actually from Australia originally, but um, so the concept of having a 100-year... A lot of, I think, of Australians <laughs> talk about a 100-year-old building as being a heritage-listed yeah. building. I think it is all to do with the actual history around the building. So, for example, um, in the 60s and 70s, when I was growing up, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot younger than I appear, um, but <laughs> they were tearing down buildings, literally tearing down buildings that were built in the 14th, 15th century. And as for Georgian and Victorian architecture, well, that was only, that's brand new, that was only yesterday. So they started, but people came back and they started saying, no, you can't do that, at least you've got to leave the facade. So there's many, many streets in Dublin that look as, if, look as if they're from the 1850s, but you walk through the front door, the great big Dublin doors, and you walk into a modern building, which is fine. When you look at the buildings on this side, and I have to put a plug in, of course, for this side, is that the Edward Giles Stone building is, turns 100 years in three years' time. 
ba basically when we've finished refitting it and refurbishing it and bring, giving it a new life. It's third life, incidentally. It had a life when it was built in, in 1923. It was refurbished in the early 2000s and now it's going to be refurbished again. But all three of those levels, layers of, I'm sounding like an architect, of those three layers, if you like, of design will be there. But as to history, this site had at one stage, for those of you who may or may not know, 10,000 people working on it between the wars. So there's history, and that's something that needs to be retained. And it is only 100 years old, but also this is the last single example, this site, the last single example of this type of industrial heritage left in Australia. There were two, the other one was Newcastle. Newcastle removed theirs to make way for the city project. So, you know, it has to be about what happened in the building, around the building, and what that building was associated with, as far as I'm concerned. And how would you say, Dom, that though, that history is um, being uh, addressed in what's happening now? Well, I think within the stone building, I mean, and again, not an architect, but we are retaining a lot of the original machinery, a lot of the original, uh, the, all the walls. I mean, if you will not, we're not going to do any uh, cosmetic work to the outside of the building. It's going to stay the way it is. But also, we're simply just putting in floors. So this is actually just going to increase the number of people. So rather than having the three or 400 people that go through that building on any given day, we will actually probably have about six to 800 people inside it. So it's bringing people. It's making reusing, and it's a certainly adaptive reuse, but it will be full of, of people, and it will be an outwardly facing building. But it will certainly retain many, many of the characteristics of the original building, as will the, the architecture building as well. That's my plug in. I'd like to... Um to turn now to the people aspect um, of cities uh, and I think uh, ask a question which uh, is, can be a sensitive one, um, but I think it's the essential one in actually any kind of urban conversation and that is the question of who. Who are we doing certain things for? What is the constituency or the audience or the the uh, stakeholder, the, the people for whom um, a building is preserved or a, bu a building is, is uh, redeveloped uh, or a, a place is, um, is, uh, is turned into a park or alternatively turned into a, into a highway. Who, if, we th if we think about the people of Launceston and the strong identity that this place has, um, and we think also about uh, the uh, the new populations that are going to be occupying this site here in Inveresk. And we also think about uh, a really prominent driver, I think, for a lot of um, the Tasmanian economy recently, which is tourism. Um, who, who are we really uh, preserving uh, our places of heritage significance for? Um, I'd like, you know, the panelists to reflect on, on the linkage between tourism, um, you know, visitors and uh, and often tourists include people who are from a long way away, and uh, the heritage preservation angle. Um, I know Cumulus, for example, Pippa has uh, been playing a bit in this space recently. Um, do you have any? perspectives on that one? Um, yes, okay, so I think when you're asking who, it's the people of Launceston, I guess, now, but I guess it goes back to that continuum and that we're designing and we're thinking about the past, but I guess this evening's theme is about looking to the future. So we're not just designing for people here and now, the client of the day that's coming to the office and saying they want this particular brief, but we're thinking about um, their use of the space or um, the future uses of the space um, and the way that we can adapt buildings so that the, they're in a um, better condition moving forward. Um, they've been repaired, um, but also the footprint or the design layout allows for future change or future adaption that may be something that we can't even foresee yet or expect yet, but um, has that level of flexibility. Um, but I don't know that that really answers who, because I think it's always people. 
Yeah, but there are so many different kind of groups of people, are there not? As um, any uh, any of the councillors here would, would recognise that you're always balancing different constituencies for any decision that is made. Um, and uh, in relation to, say, for example, heritage, there's a, a constituency that regards heritage as anti-development, um, for example, and and development is economy. And this addresses, I think, Lucy, uh, one of the key messages you wanted to bring mm -hmm. to the table today was that it's not an either or, that there's an economic benefit. And in fact, you could argue that the benefit may even be greater. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm also, also alluding to the fact that in heritage preservation districts, um, I think this is well developed or more uh, extensively um, an issue in, in many European cities is the problems of, of what you might simply call Disneyfication, yeah. in which, let's say, Venice, for example, uh, becomes uh, a site for um, the experience of um, some image called Venice mm. for millions of people around the world, and that this is this um, uh, an appropriate um, angle or aspect of uh, for heritage to encourage or foster? Or how do you then work with that tendency? So I, th I think it's important that we maintain a balance with all of these things. And so, so one, one response to your question is, what is the project and what is the use? But if we step back from that a mo from, for a moment and, and I, I touch on your, um, your point about the who and, and the tourism, within um, heritage practice um, and tourism more broadly, we do have very important cultural heritage tourism sites that will forevermore be managed as cultural heritage tourism places. And they are big economic drivers and they hold lots of significance for um, Tasmanians and Australians, but probably not for communities more broadly than that. And for some of those places, the real value and significance is difficult for, for, for um, external visitors to really interpret and grasp and appreciate. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to operate those places for that um, for that purpose, and, and they are they are big drivers for us. But if you step away from cultural heritage tourism, which is a, you know a big beast, um, and and you look at the more granular aspects of a city, it's important to consider what the significance of any one place is. Does it have a continued use? You know, ha has that use been a continuum since its construction or since its inception? And does that use continue to be important to the community? And if so, how do we support that place to continue that use? Um, and that's where the nil change argument becomes really difficult because without change, we won't be able to continue to use these places for those significant um, and historic um, and continued um, functions. Beyond that, you get sites such as um, uh, the Red Ruth Brewery that uh, I presented tonight, just by way of example, and and I guess um, the Inverest campus more broadly, where the use is no longer viable and it's no longer continuous, and and that's where I think opportunity presents to identify um, appropriate and compatible uses and to sit down and consider those against um, community um, and tourism needs uh, more broadly across the city to understand how they those redundant places can make a contribution to emerging and changing need. And so it's a, it's a bit of a mix. It's almost a bit of a matrix in some respects. There are places that will, will and should forevermore be continued uh, to operate and be conserved for, for their values. But then there is opportunity beyond that, which um, shouldn't be underestimated. Leila, Myanmar must pose very yeah, that, kind of that, um, dilemmas. Yeah, that was quite interesting because the project I worked on was being run by the local government, not the central government, um, 
which was unique in that most of those buildings were getting turned over to become high-end five-star hotels and they were originally actually public buildings. Mm. So they were actually becoming, you know, a total disconnect from the community because the public weren't able to access these five-star hotels and things like that. And also for six months of the year they were empty because of monsoon, no one went to Yangon because it was so wet and mouldy. So um, that project I was working on was really about trying to allow the, the public to have some ownership over these buildings that were initially always designed as public buildings um, because it used to be the capital before it was moved. Um, and just uh, in terms of... Um, you know, heritage and culture. These the, these buildings were colonial buildings, but they also represented um, the the city of Yangon's cultural identity because it did have influences from colonialism and things like that. So it was it was a representation of their whole identity, um, and I think that's the same with Launceston. Is that these buildings and 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 spaces are representations of our our culture and they they hold or hold prompts to our kind of our stories um the rituals that we have and our family narratives and things like that so um they sort of they're like the photographs of our our sort of our culture um so then thinking about um who these pro the, what heritage is for i think it the general area rather not just the the main cultural heritage sites i'm thinking of just the city and the streetscapes and things it, it really should be focused towards the com the direct community because they're the ones that we want to build this narrative. We want to build these rituals with. And then I'm thinking of tourists. Um, when I have gone travelling, it's I want to be kind of have a certain... I like the anonymity of being a tourist and I like being able to be a bit watching the, the rituals of the, the, the city and the people around me. So I actually I don't want the city to be for me because I want to be immersed in somebody else's rituals. So I think that it is important that the, these, the cities and our, our streetscapes aren't pandering to just the tourists because then I think it loses why a tourist would go there in the first place as well. <laughs> I like this idea of uh, that, the, that, the, that those buildings that have uh, duration are the photographs of yeah. our the kind of uh, tangible photographs. But, of course, photography has changed quite a lot in recent years, hasn't it? Uh, I don't know how many tens of thousands I have on my phone. Um, I think I'll open it up now uh, to the audience to ask uh, questions. Um, is there a roving mic? If not, yes? And if no one is uh, interested... Oh. Um, it's interesting you spoke about people and especially with the tradespeople that involved in these programs. Um, I feel as though, and I guess it's a, it's a question as well as a, a brain snap, is that when people are involved in these rehabilitation programs with these buildings, is the quality of the trades and the uh, problem solving skills of the trades increases exponentially as you go through these buildings. So. Um, I think when we look at buildings around in Launceston, there's a great scope for expanding trades, architects and everybody else is involved, as well as connecting back in with our Tasmania 100% renewable thing. So I guess when we do this, it requires one thing, which is currency. Is there such a thing as the, Her uh, the Heritage Fund in Australia at this moment? We, we don't have a scheme similar to the Heritage Lottery Fund because all of our investment and spending goes into sport 
Um, <laughs> you know, quite sorry, quite seriously. Um, it, 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 but you. And well, yeah. Well, that's that's potentially a very important investment. Um, it, it it is a really important consideration, and I can't pretend that access to um, trade skills and traditional trade skills is easy for these projects. It's out there, and there are some incredibly competent and capable craftspeople in the state of Tasmania. There aren't enough of them, but there aren't enough of them anywhere. Um, and and it's, it is a, a genuine need um, to, to really to bring understanding of, of um, construction, not only for tradespeople, but for architects, you know, who, who are also custodians and make contributions to these places, to have a really sound understanding about what, you know, what traditional building techniques are and, and the risk of contemporary building techniques to this fabric. Um, it's not taught at universities um, in Australia. Um, not yet. And, and, yeah. <laughs> and they're, they're not skills that are taught necessarily in TAFEs. We do have some masonry programs um, and unfortunately they're not, you know, yielding enough masons. But beyond that, plasterers, painters, you know, everybody thinks they're a DIY painter these days. But, you know, there's a hell of a lot more to um, applied finishes than a tub of Dulux from Bunnings. Um, and an appreciation about the risk of what that tub of Dulux can do in, you know, in the simplest of ways. Dom. Uh, just a comment about funding for heritage restorations. While there's no actual, my understanding, a direct fund, a lot of the f uh, projects under the city deals all around Australia are actually restoration. So for example, you know, this side here, but likewise in other cities around. So there could be heritage funding for restoration can be embedded in what is now becoming the major way in which the federal and state governments are going to start funding the revitalization of our cities, but also the restoration of our cities moving into the future. And just as a comment, I spoke with our project manager yesterday, and um, some of you may or may not be tradies here, but apparently a first year out of apprenticeship is earning $85,000 a year which is absolutely phenomenal. So we just, yeah, we do need to be trading more of them. And there, I think there are some really um, small initiatives that um, decision makers can introduce to support those sorts of things. So if, if as council um, or, as a, um, or as a property owner or as a state government or federal government, you are procuring a project with, um, with an interface with some of these traditional trade skills, why not consider putting in some procurement criteria that encourage people to, you know, engage some of those apprentices or to do some um, trade skills training? If you find that you're struggling to get the plasterers, the stonemasons, the painters, um, the, the carpenters, maybe ask why and look to upskill your teams on site in support of this continuation of really important knowledge. We have another question. Yeah, um, Councillor Alan Harris. So um, as a councillor, we sit and we approve development applications every month. Uh, and I just sort of wondered whether each of you could look and I, I just, we're talking about heritage. What is the heritage that we're building for the next 100 years? And if each of you have an example of a building that you could say, yep, that's going to stand the test of time, I'm not sure that the stand-up concrete slab of an uh, office works will be what we'll look at in 100 years in the same way that we might look at the um, wonderful terraces on the corner of Cameron Street and Wellington Street with the turret. Um, for those of you who can picture that, uh, which I think, you know, what is the legacy we're going to be leaving our... Um, city and if you can't think of one perhaps you might think of a building that was built and we consider it ugly now but perhaps we'll grow to love it um, and I guess the most obvious one for that would be one civic square um, <laughs> Henty House yes Henty House that's it yes so um, I don't know if you can perhaps part or just each of you could think of a particular building in Launceston that, in Launceston if possible um, if, if not perhaps one that we might all know one that would that would would still be here in a hundred years and admired, stand the test of time, and perhaps be worth re, re, regenerating into a new life, rather Albert than just knocking it down. 
No, can let, that, that's already here. What I'm saying is something's being built now or oh, perhaps no. has been yeah. built, yep. in, even in the last 50 years, because, I mean, people look at the Telstra building and they go, that's ugly, you know. Are we ever going to love that? Are we gonna, ever going to love Myers, um, which was Cox Brothers? <laughs> there are Don't. people who think that Handy House is a stunning building. Oh, well, a lot of and, people and in this go. room. And, and I, I suppose just rolling one out there, I visited uh, a university in Vancouver a few years ago, and it was the main set for Battlestar Galactica because it was an entirely brutalist campus it's called Simon, Simon, Fraser, Simon University. Fraser University. Yep. All they had to do was remove the modern looking stuff out of it that suggested it was 20th, 21st century. But some people think brutalist architecture is stunning. I actually, I've started, I've lived here for 30 years. I've started to like that building, not love it, like it. You've spent too much time around those Architects Anonymous clubs, haven't you? I think the thing that comes into question when you're talking about that is aesthetics and architecture and that not everybody likes the same thing but what Lucy is talking about is craftsmanship and materiality and enduring buildings and so the thing that comes like into our practice as an architect day to day is thinking about how you can collaborate with tradesmen to get the best outcome um, for the client at the time, but for the client of the future. And um, sometimes it's using those traditional trades or sometimes it's looking to like modern technologies, but um, it's not about um, saying whether Henty House is amazing <laughs> or not. It's about um, respecting it for its quality and it was built with a lot of quality and flexibility and um, yeah, therefore, it's those types of buildings that will um, contribute to the context of our city and the way that everyone knows the building that you're talking about. So it's part of our cultural heritage and that's what's important, I think. Yeah, I was thinking it, 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 it's built with intent. Like, there is, a, there is an intent behind it. There was thought in it. And the same with the Maya building as well. And that... I think used to have a restaurant on the top of it, yeah. I think. And I think my mum describes that that was the, sort of a major outing was going there and, and going and having a, a, a you know, a, a ice chocolate or something on the top of it. So um, I think, yeah, it is about the intent. And I think a tilt up slab for office works, there isn't a lot of intent behind there. It, it's, it is made around function but maybe the value then is more in the materials and and the the the, the sort of yeah the, the embodied energy that's in it rather than um the the design quality and maybe we you you still can reuse it but create a new identity i'm trying to think of one outside of henty house i think i'll just leave it there mm. um Is that your place, Helen? <laughs> um, okay, so um, look, I, I think um, there's there's your um, apologies, Councillor I, I, Harrison, Councillor Harrison. Uh, your your question provokes um, another question, uh, which I'm going to um, pose to our panelists here, which, um, by way of slightly bringing things towards the close. Um, and it, it, it goes to the question of time, because obviously when we are talking about heritage, we're talking about time. And uh, really the larger um, kind of set of issues that we are exploring through heritage architecture, preservation, conservation, and indeed development is ways of handling time in space. Um, so Condensing that down to a, a, a simple or maybe simplistic question, do you think that buildings, and I'll ask each panellist in turn, that, that a building, let's say a new building, should be timeless or contemporary? Well, it's contemporary at the time. <laughs> Is there no distinction? Let me.
me think about that when you walk down. <laughs> <laughs> I think the important thing for me within practice is understanding that what we are doing um, might be for a building of now, but it's within a much bigger context. And our built heritage is one part of our history, but there's a whole lot of other cultural and um, history of the people of this land that needs to be considered within that and thought about um, for um, the future. Yeah, I think um, it, if you're going to build something, then you may as well build it with quality and and make sure that it is going to last another 100 years. I think if you're going to do that, um, you may as well sort of use that energy that you put into it for a good use. So then I think it's going to be contemporary, but I think the, the main thing about the design is really that it has to communicate with the context and and the buildings that are around it or the, the, the people and how they use it. And, and then what the design that comes from that should be timeless. <laughs> but contemporary. It, it would automatically yeah. be timeless yeah. through if you follow that process, yeah. is your argument. I'm going to channel my, my inner philosopher and say that um, if a building is beautiful, it will remain timeless, but beauty is always in the eye of the beholder. So <laughs> yeah. basically, I mean, you know, as we talked about Henty House earlier on, there's buildings, for example, I've, I've spent, prior to COVID, I spent a lot of time in Melbourne visiting friends and colleagues over there. And uh, we were traveling through um, the Docklands and my partner turned around and said, gosh, they're ugly buildings. They will not stand the test of time. Hopefully nobody here is an architect who designed them, by the way. But um, so I just think it is, if, and it is quality. I think if a building is built with absolute quality, it will become a, a timeless building. And I think, I remember having a discussion with Jackie a few months ago regarding some buildings <coughs> around uh, Launceston and the fact that there are modern buildings which have got, that are quite beautiful, and so therefore they should be modern heritage, I suppose, because we want to make sure that they are retained into the future. I'm sounding like an architect yet again. But um, that... Anyway. You missed your calling, Tom. Um, Lucy, did you want to, before... No, I think they've summed still... it up beautifully. Yeah. Simone, is it? Yeah. Can you... Um, so, uh, based on Rob Adams' presentation, talking about time, and a city that has grown substantially in terms of population. It's obviously very different to Launceston. How do you ensure that all these moments of memory and place that everybody's talking about are um, considered but not resting on the laurels as, as Launceston continues to expand to... Um, house the number of people that are living here. So the housing estates, if we look outside of the city, how can the beauty that everyone is talking about be projected out to um, ensure that there's an equality uh, through building, is my question to the panel. Tricky one. Would anyone like to dive in? I was actually um, thinking about how the city of Launceston actually is quite dense in, in, the, in the earlier, like Cimitier Street, the density of the housing is actually quite dense, but our newer developments are actually really, you know, expansive. And I think that's probably where I would, we should be looking a little bit more to the patterns of cities that we already have here so that we're not expanding more and more because I think that we already have a, a good pattern here. <laughs> yeah, I think the two things for me are investment in density and investment in public places and I think the public spaces of our city like City Park and Princess Square have been the places that throughout history have brought together co the community um, and I think um, currently festivals um, like Festivali or Junction Art 
Arts Festival, uh, or Open House Launceston, uh, events that are bringing the community together in those really important places. And I think beyond that, when the balance of the investment in density and public places, because they're two incredibly important things, but we're always going to end up with this urban sprawl, unfortunately. Back to Rob's talk, it's encouraging those developers who are driving those land releases to invest as much in those spaces as the city has done historically. Um, because so when you talk about the the equality of that experience. We need to understand that within those um, new communities and some of those new urban land release areas, um, to, to encourage that connection and understanding about the significance of the city, somehow we need to be driving some of those initiatives out. And they're much bigger urban planning gestures, probably beyond, yeah. I guess, the talk of today. But I think as much as we need to be bringing it in, um, to reduce how far it goes out, we need to be thinking about how we spread it out as well. Yeah, and I think um, I echo those thoughts from my own perspective and uh, simply to say that the new parts of the city are places where people live and people, as Dom reminded us and others, are really at the core of what we mean by the city and what we value in the city. It is important that we don't, in a way, throw the baby out with the bathwater by rejecting the, the periphery because people live there. The key is that those places need to be places. Mm. They need to have, they need to be pieces of the city too, rather than non-places that don't have any specific um, identity. So that, that would be my thought on that. We're coming to a close. Um, I haven't said too much. I've facilitated the conversation. I'll leave you this with this from my own perspective, which really uh, derives from living in a city which is completely the opposite of uh, this place and certainly also of Melbourne. Uh, that is the city of Tokyo, which I lived in for 13 years. Uh, Tokyo is a place where there is no heritage, effectively. I mean, it's an exaggeration, but there's effectively no heritage. Um, the average lifespan of a building is 26 years. That's the life expectancy of the building, not even the average lifespan. It's the ex how long you expect a building to, to, to survive for. 26 years. If you wish to find a building that is older than 50 years, you really have to hunt. You really have to hunt. The entire city is built three times in a person's lifetime. As a place, it is incredibly culturally rich, uh, vibrant with energetic streets and uh, a sense, a real sense of cultural depth without any heritage. It's a conundrum. It's a mystery. And in that mystery, I think, lies a lot of really interesting ways of thinking differently about heritage and cities that, um, that are not, uh, is not aiming to um, uh, denigrate heritage as such, but just to think about what is it that we preserve and through what do we preserve the things that we preserve? What is preserved in a place like Tokyo are the craftsmanship, the networks, the small um, patterns of land ownership, of, um, of uh, local uh, community, uh, local, local communities' rituals. It's a place where it's the, not the materiality of the city that counts so much as the vitality of the city uh, in its spaces. And, um, you know, it's a place, I think, that actually, instead of the built matter of the city, it's actually the time, it's the rhythms of the place that is preserved and has been the same for hundreds and hundreds of years. 
So with that reflection, um, I'll leave you and call the occasion to a close. Thank you. And thanks all to our panel panelists. Yep. Guy, thanks guys. Um, I'm an accountant and I was just wondering whether a panel of architects were going to be as inspiring as we would be. And, uh, um, and, and I've been, you know, maybe just you Dom, because you're not an architect. No, but it's been absolutely fascinating to listen to all of you and give you your perspective. So thank you very much so to uh, Lucy, Pepper, Layla and Dom for your participation on the panel, it's been fantastic. And Julian, for your insight and guidance throughout that, that's been terrific. So really, just another great round of applause for our, our panel. I mean, I joined the um, Heritage Advisory Committee of the Council five or six years ago because I wanted to learn about our heritage and uh, this has confused me more. No, <laughs> no it's, it's, it's brought lots of perspective and I think, you know, the reality is heritage is a lot of things. It's not just buildings. Um, it's place. It's, it's all sorts of things. So today is places of Launceston. We learn about places in England and Wales and, 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 and Victoria. Uh, but they all mould together to give us a tapestry of things that could be, that are, that may be in the future. So I really thank all of the all the presenters today for what they've brought to the contribution to the conversations today. I've been excited, so I really thank the guys from, from City of Launceston in pulling this together tonight. I think it's been fantastic. And hopefully there will be future conversations for us. But just as a sort of final uh, farewell, uh, just remember uh, Heritage uh, Launceston started, so go to www system was up there, uh, something something her heritage, uh, slash heritage, uh, to find the entry forms or pick one up on the way out. And don't forget to go to Open Houses Hobart to find about Open Houses Lawn System, uh, which are coming up on the 28th. And I think Pippa or somebody mentioned something about uh, Junction Art Festival, which happens the week after. So a great prelude into Junction Art Festival. And I think when I went on there quickly a few moments ago, not that I was bored, um, uh, to have a look, there's more than what was announced, I think, that you can actually go and see in the Heritage uh, open, ho open Houses Lonnie. So please go and do that. And I really thank you all for coming and participating tonight. To me, it's been a fantastic sort of uh, uh, presentation and it's been great to share it with all of you tonight. So go home and be safe and think more about the Heritage of Launceston as you walk around. Look up, don't look down. So thank you very much.